thank you for the introduction and for having me uh, hold this lecture. So uh, I'm uh, working in, in the medical ICU MIVA at Södersjukhuset in Stockholm and I'm heading a research group called the Cardiac Arrest Center uh, at the Karolinska and we are uh, doing a number of uh, large randomized clinical trials in cardiac arrest ranging from the, from the person's home with the simplified CPR to more advanced treatment in the hospital. Um, I, my topic today is optimal pre-hospital care. Uh, it's a rather wide subject, I would say. Uh, I, be, I will obviously uh, not speak about the first link, which Teresa covered perfectly. And uh, uh, also the, the hospital or the ICU phase of, of uh, treating these patients is also beyond the scope of today's lecture. But uh, in speaking about uh, optimal pre-hospital care, uh, I'll try to cover the, the, the other aspects of the chain of the survival concept uh, based uh, of uh, what I think is, is, is important. So, uh, start with the basic CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. And, and um, I think that the first question that I will, I will touch upon is, is whether or not CPR is life-saving at all. Uh, perhaps this goes without saying, but this was actually a question that was raised a few years ago in, a, in a New England, uh, in an editorial in New England, whether or not we should, we should do this uh, at all. Uh, there is no randomized control trial for CPR, uh, so we did a Swedish trial, a Swedish uh, large registry study uh, for, for covering all th three decades of patients suffering cardiac arrest in Sweden. Uh, and we could show in this trial that the chance of surviving a cardiac arrest is more than doubled if CPR is started prior to arrival of the ambulance. And what I think is most important uh, finding of this study is this, that this goes for all subgroups of patients. It doesn't matter if the patient is old or young, if it's a man or a female, or what the initial rhythm is and so on. So, so I think that we can conclude that, that the CPR is a life-saving measure. So if we move on from there, What's the next step? Well, I think that leads us on to the quality of CPR. Are we good at doing CPR? Um, well, unfortunately, we are probably not. Uh, this is a rather old study now, but this is a Swedish and Norwegian patients uh, where uh, with real cases of cardiac arrest where ambulance personnel uh, and others, uh, kind of pros, uh, have, have treated these patients. And in this study, uh, they found that chest compressions were not performed during almost half of the time where there was no circulation. And another finding was that the, t the chest compressions that were given were of rather poor quality. So, so is CPR quality important? Well, we think it is, uh, or we actually know it is. This is a data showing the effect on success with defibrillation, or shock success. And if you look on the left part of the screen here, you can see that even very brief pauses in chest compressions diminishes the chance of uh, succeeding with the defibrillation attempt. And this goes before the defibrillation, also the pause after the defibrillation. So I think that we can conclude that uh, CPR is life-saving and that pauses in chest compressions is really bad. So the question then, uh, if we move on, how can we increase bystander CPR? Because in many countries, uh, about two thirds of patients, perhaps half of the patients, uh, receive the patient uh, receives bystander CPR, uh, uh, but the other part don't. So uh, we we have in Sweden, in many other countries, used mass uh, education of the public. Uh, we have about a third of the population that's been trained in CPR in Sweden, uh, and we have about uh, we have had uh, rates of about 50 percent. And we have this kind of normal uh, chain of, uh, of treatment when someone collapses. Someone calls the dispatch center, who dispatches an ambulance or even a police car in a fire department. And this takes about 10, 11 minutes. But we developed, uh, like Teresa mentioned here before, a system where we could uh, localize trained rescuers with the cell phones at any given moment. And what we did in this trial is that we, we alerted those trained uh, lay rescuers that were uh, close in the very vicinity of, of the cardiac arrest uh, to, to run to the patient and perform CPR. And this uh, system actually increased the proportion of patients receiving bystander CPR by 30%. 
So I think this is a very important step, prob and also the, the kind of telephone instruction part of this, uh, this um, uh, question is also important, but we need to increase our uh, bystander CPR numbers in order to increase survival. So, okay, so chest compression and early CPR is important, but what about ventilations? What's the value of ventilations? Uh, this is a large topic, obviously, I will just briefly touch upon this. What do we know? Well, there are a few randomized clinical trials. Uh, the first one are dispatched uh, assisted uh, telephone CPR that came out a, a number of years ago where there was a randomization performed by, between uh, for patients receiving either simplified CPR with only chest compressions or standard CPR with chest compressions and ventilations. There was no significant differences in, in any of these studies, but in the meta-analysis, there was a significant uh, increase for the, for the a simplified CPR uh, for untrained re lay rescue. So, so, so for if you're untrained lay rescue, you can do only chest compressions only. Well, well, what about the rest? What about the public that's been trained? What about uh, medical personnel? Well, we, we do know some uh, something. This is a study that came out uh, two years ago, I think, from, from uh, North America, where they did a similar study. Simplified CPR with only chest compressions for six minutes or uh, standard CPR in the other group. And this was for dispatched uh, trained uh, firefighters. So basically kind of first tire ambulances that performed this study. And there was no difference in survival uh, in, in, in these two, among these two groups even though there was a trend towards better outcome in the standard group. So that's the, that's the kind of situation for, for ventilation at this moment. And I think we have a lot more to learn about uh, what patients would benefit from simplified CPR or not. So I move on to early defibrillation. Uh, uh, this is perhaps the most important slide of today, showing, probably you've seen, many of you have seen this, it's a, it's a slide showing survival on the one side and time to defibrillation on the other side. And it takes about 14 minutes today in, in Sweden, I think in many, most other countries, to, to shock a patient. Few minutes for the vic for the the witness to recognize that's a cardiac arrest. Another minute uh, at best at the dispatch center, uh, and then 10, 11 minutes for the ambulance to to reach the patient and to put the AED on and to give a shock. And this leaves us with a survival of about 10 percent, which we have at 10, 11 percent in Sweden at this point. But as as uh, and uh, I can skip this. But as Teresa mentioned, we we can we can reach survival of about 70 percent if we are really 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 fast. But the problem is that two thirds of cardiac arrests occur in the patients' homes. So that leaves only about third patients that are accessible to so-called public access defibrillation uses of public defibrillators. And if you look at this group a little bit more specifically, only 2.5 percent of all cardiac arrest cases occur in these so-called high incident sites. One of those we are at this moment, large malls, uh, shopping centers and so on. But this is a very small minority of patients uh, that uh, have their cardiac arrest in these types of uh, sites. So, so we need to find new ways of put, getting the defibrillators to the patient. And I think personally that this type of new techniques like cell phones, like uh, dispatch of AEDs through dispatch centers is, is, uh, is, is, is something that we have to work on because there is about 40, 45, perhaps 50,000 AEDs outside in Sweden at this moment in hospital, uh, in, in hotels, in, in, in uh, shopping malls, etc. But it's only about 2.5 to 5 percent of cases that these are used. So cell phones is one way. Another way would be using drones to, to transport defibrillators. This is actually uh, started as a fun, just a kind of a toy project in Stockholm, but it's, it's turned out to be a real clinical project that we have been working on now for a few years, actually. And we have developed a, a, a medical drone carrying an AED that uh, is this can be dispatched and, and uh, we can f has been shown to fly out of sight. Uh, for, for the first time. And we just recently published uh, our uh, uh, first data in Yama this summer where we compared uh, the ambulance drone to standard EMS, uh, historical cases, and we c there was a, l a large time gain uh, for this type of uh, dispatch of, of AEDs. 
There's a lot of challenges in this aspect. We need to uh, work closely uh, with the air, airway re regulations and so on. But I'm convinced if we are really to increase survival in cardiac arrest, we have to uh, uh, find new ways of, of getting the defibrillators to the patients. So that's, that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about basic CPR. Uh, I think that's the, still the key message good uh, chest compression uh, CPR and early defibrillation are the still the key two things in, in terms of, of uh, increasing survival in cardiac arrest. I have a few more minutes. I'm going to speak about ACLS a little bit. Uh, first, uh, the drug. Uh, what about drugs? Uh, well, uh, I have to mention Teresa study uh, from uh, uh, 2009 where um, uh, ACLS was compared to ACLS without IV access. And then in this trial, there was a, a significant uh, higher number proportion of patients that were admitted to hospital alive, but uh, survival to discharge was no difference between the group, two groups. And there's one a placebo controlled trial for adrenaline, uh, which came out from Australia and New Zealand which showed about the same things. There was a significantly more uh, high proportion of patients receiving ROSC and admittance, but survival was uh, no difference between the two groups. But if you look at the numbers here, it's five patients only in each group surviving. Uh, this is a very, very a small study. And this study was, was actually stopped early due to um, large protest from, from the public and from media due to the randomization procedure that was called the human lottery and so on. So, so I think the question about adrenaline is still, still up there and we, we await some answers. What about antiarrhythmics? Well, last year a study was published, uh, first large study of antiarrhythmics in cardiac arrest, uh, amiodarone and lidocaine. That were compared to placebo, it was uh, uh, there was no significant difference in in uh, survival to discharge in this study. But for bystander witnessed cases, there was a, a significant uh, increase for for the antiarrhythmics. So I think that this, they still have a, a, a important place in in the treatment of cardiac arrest patients. Um, then we have the question about other drugs. I think uh, this study from Greece uh, with a cocktail of adrenaline, vasopressin and steroids is very interesting. This is an in-hospital study, but I think it's uh, important in the out-of-hospital uh, context as well, where th this cocktail was compared to uh, ad adrenaline and placebo. And they could actually show, it's one of the few studies in drugs that have been shown, shown a survival difference. It was more than a doubled survival uh, uh, for this population. It is a one, it is a one site study, it has not been remade and it's not been taken into the, the international guidelines for, 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 for CPR, but I think this is very important. I think we, that this study should be um, done again by other groups uh, in order to see if there is something here that can really change uh, the outcome. So we await this. Uh, that's one I think I would. Uh, I think it's important to await in terms of drugs, and then also the paramedic two trial that's ongoing in in, Lond in, in England at this moment. It's a placebo-controlled uh, adrenaline trial. I think they aim for 8,000 patients. It's been going on for a few years, and this will have an important. Uh, uh, this will add a lot of information in, in the adrenaline question. I think, and then there are other uh, drugs, beta blockers, levonorgestrel, that that I think are very exciting and especially in refractory cardiac arrest patients. Just one slide about airway management. Um, uh, this is also a very big topic. Uh, uh, the, they have, there is some registry data that point towards better survival if, if we use simple airway management. Uh, but if we are to use some more advanced uh, uh, airway management, perhaps it's better with intubation. But I. I think I want my, my uh, interpretation of this is that uh, all of these kind of uh, statements, and uh, they are based on very low evidence registry data in terms of airway management. So I think eagerly we await the three ongoing randomized clinical trials that you can see on, on the uh, lower part of the question where laryngeal tube is compared to intubation and then there is the Fre French trial that's uh, uh, comparing mass ventilation uh, versus intubation. So, uh, so I think this will give us uh, some answers in terms of airway management, and we, we await data within the, 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 the next few years. Then we are performing a Swedish study, uh, which is it's, it's for trained lay rescuers, lay rescuers in terms of uh, CPR 
simplified versus standard CPU, and that will we hope also to to have answer within a few years. One minute about hyperthermia. We have uh, Hans and Niklas uh, uh, study. Obviously, all of you are aware of the TTM1 trial, and, and we are eagerly await the TTM2 trial, which is starting now. Uh, and then we have the recently published uh, 24 versus 48 uh, hour trial, which showed no difference in primary outcome. But we have to remember that these are hospital trials, and uh, I, I, I was asked to cover the pre-hospital uh, question. And there, there are some interesting data also in the pre-hospital setting for cooling. Well, and the largest trial so far is the RINS trial that was published last year. It's by Stephen Bernard and colleagues in, in Australia. And uh, this was a negative trial. There was no difference in, in survival for, for the whole population, but there was actually lower proportion of ROSC rate in, in the uh, interventional arm with uh, cold saline. And also in this arm, there was a high proportion of patients uh, uh, having uh, acute pulmonary edema. So cold fluids in the pre-hospital setting uh, intra rest is something that's not recommended. We are uh, running the PRINCESS trial. Uh, it's a European trial with intra-arrest, uh, intra-nasal uh, uh, cooling trial. It's a randomized trial that we, we're going uh, to end late this year and we hope to present data late next year, uh, which we hope will add also to this uh, question about uh, temperature management in the pre-hospital setting. And then my last topic, just one minute, it's the uh, eCPR. We will have uh, a lo hear a lot about this in the next few talks. Uh, the purpose of this uh, treatment is obviously to, to bridge uh, the patient to some kind of treatment, and that's mostly an occluded coronary vessel. And uh, wh now, uh, with the Stan and his colleagues showing that mechanical CPR is as, as good as a very good manual CPR, for the first time we have some data that, uh, that gives us the possibility to transport patients with ongoing CPR to the hospital. And uh, we will hear, hear a lot about in the next talk about whether or not we should do this. But I would like to raise one question, and, and that's whether or not we shouldn't um, establish or go more towards cardiac arrest centers. I, I think. Perhaps we should treat uh, cardiac arrest patients like we do with trauma. We have trauma one hospitals taking care of these patients. As, as we get more advanced therapies in the hospitals, perhaps we should steer our, I'm not saying we should, I'm just raising the question here, but perhaps we should steer our patients towards kind of more advanced hospital treatments. Okay, just we are planning a, an ECMO trial in Stockholm. We are setting up an ECMO pro, uh, program in Sweden uh, or Stockholm, perhaps even Scandinavia, where we intend to uh, choose young patients with refractory cardiac arrest under 65 years of age, uh, treat, treat them very, very shortly on scene, uh, just three cycles of CPR. If they do not uh, receive ROS, they will be transported to uh, to the ho to hospital with ECMO possibility with mechanical CPR and put on ECMO. And hopefully uh, we will do this later as a randomized trial in the end. So, we are at 11 survival per percent today. Uh, how good can we uh, become? Well, I think at least we should aim for 20%, perhaps 25% um, uh, in, in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. But in order to do that, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, we need to perfect each of the steps in this relay, each of the steps in the uh, uh, chain of survival, starting with the uh, witnesses and the dispatch center towards the public and then into the hospital and the ICU period. If we optimize e each of these steps and we, we evaluate new methods, I think that we can reach as good as 20 to 25%. Thank you very much.